Welcome to Encounter Wargaming, I'm Jay and today we're going to be taking a look at the 3rd edition Codex Armageddon. Alright, Codex Armageddon. So, after we did the Orcs last week, I thought it would be great if we went straight on to Codex Armageddon. Uh, I I'm not entirely sure of the exact order of the releases, because again, it was so many years ago, but I think this was the next to actually be released in order anyway out of all of the third edition codices. So it's only fitting that we go on to it next. So also because it exp obviously expands upon the rules for orcs. There's also rules for Steel Legion, uh, I believe the Salamanders, Black Templars, um, and yeah that might even be it. Uh, well I guess we'll find out in a minute, right? So uh, basically this was one of the first campaign books they released for third edition. Uh, we saw a couple of the ones that they released in second edition, but for third, um, like I say, because the codices were so small and so um, succinct, I guess is the best word to use. Very streamlined is actually probably a better word to use. Um, they started releasing these supplement codexes, so um, like I say, we've seen the rules for Space Marines, we've seen the rules for Orcs, and now uh, we're gonna see the expansion onto both, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, this just allowed you to add a little more flavor to your lists. I mean, when it came to pickup games, uh, people were actually using this stuff competitively. It doesn't ha you don't have to be playing the campaign, per se, in order to use the forces in this book. It just gives you more selections for your army lists and stuff like that. So, anyway, long story short, let's get into this thing. First of all, iconic scene between Gazgal Thraka and Commissar Yark. Now I believe this was when they came out with the current Gazgal model as well as the current Yark model. So we've seen both of them in second edition and what they looked like back then. Of course, like I said in the Orc video from last week, uh, the Orcs got a huge aesthetic redo with this edition and uh, I guess they wanted to bring Gazgal up to match. So there he is right there, the big Prophet of Dawa himself, uh, and Yark. Of course, they gave they wanted to give him a new, new er looking orc power claw. I suppose because the power claw in the second dead model was obviously looked like the second dead orc aesthetic. So in order to tie everything together, of course, they wanted to update the Yark model, and they did a great job. In fact, to the point where we're still using both of those models today. Uh, what is it? Jeez. 20 years later at this point. Uh, I guess we'll find out in a second because we're about to look at the publishing information. So let's just check this out. All right, as usual, they put sort of the table of contents and the publishing information on the same page as well as the introduction in this case. Oh, crazy, look at this. $12 price tag on that. <laughs> when will you ever get a book from Games Workshop for $12 ever again? It just won't happen. So anyway, let's take a gander at these color pages first because it's always fun to see the models like I say um, of different eras and how things have evolved so as you can see we'll st we're still using the old second dead bikes the Gorka Morka tracks and uh, trucks um, and then these war coptas here or the death coptas are actually the pewter ones that they came out with for uh, Gorka Morka and I don't believe they've ever actually redone the model they released plastic ones in fourth edition uh, for the Black Reach starter set, I believe it was. But they never actually released those plastic ones in a set on their own. You could only get them in the starter set, and they expected you to buy these pewter ones, which are just absolutely ancient at this point. Uh, I'm so glad that now in 8th they've redone the buggies, and the and they redid the bikes like just before 5th dropped, so that's something. But uh, I still have a bunch of these old school bikes in my army, and uh, yeah. I think they're wicked cool, and I mean... It just, it's all about nostalgia, right guys? I mean, really? Especially those of you watching who have been in the game for 20 years or, or more. We have so many great memories of our times playing this game over the years that you can't help but be nostalgic when you see stuff like this. Um, and even here you can actually see that they're using the old second dead rhino and, uh, almost said Razorback, the uh, Predator. Now this is the brand new at this point Land Raider kit, which looks light years better than the old Rogue Trader one. Like I say, in second edition, 
I'm not even entirely sure near the end there if you could even get the Rogue Trader one. And then when third dropped, they dropped this model on us, and it's funny now because we have things like Stompas and Bane Blades and uh, Questorus Knights and, and stuff like that, but uh, at this time, anyway, this was the biggest plastic model that they ever produced. So just think of how mind-blowing that was at this time. Um, interesting, they got the spaced armor here. That's pretty cool on the old school Rhino. I haven't seen that before. That's pretty neat. And of course, the Steel Legion. Now, I believe they came out with this model line specifically for this campaign. All these pewter models here, the Steel Legion models, which still to this day are absolutely beautiful models. Um, there's one guy in our gaming club, uh, Brian, he plays Steel Legion, and he purposely went online and found all of these old school models and has done a great job of painting them up and, you know, bringing them into the new uh, Warhammer 40,000. It's amazing how the old guard models still hold up even today. Uh, I Personally, I love the Steel Legion look. I like the long coats. I like the gas masks. Um, they're almost just as cool as the Kriegers, if not cooler. So... If that's the aesthetic you're going for, Steel Legion are an awesome choice. Anyway, back to publishing information. So let's see here. Yep, it's actually 2000 this year, the year this book came out. So we're not quite at 20 years ago yet, but pretty damn close. And as you can see here uh, in the table of contents, of course, they're giving you a lot of history in this book because, again, it's a campaign, so this is a very narrative uh, scenario they're setting up for you, but also there is Cult of Speed rules, um, and then the Forces of Armageddon they're calling it, I guess. Um, huh, I was going to say, I guess that's the Steel Legion, but actually they got the Steel Legion list here listed separately. Oh, well, we'll go all the way through it, right? So we'll get there eventually. But the Black Templars, the Salamanders, the Steel Legion, and then just extra ideas and uh, force dispositions. That's interesting. I think that's just the color pages. Uh, so, let's get into this. Awesome artwork, as always. The thing that really makes the at least the old school codices really narrative is this awesome artwork that they just decorate everything with. Especially in this edition, even though there wasn't, they weren't huge books, they were definitely quality books. I love the artwork everywhere. And like I say, guys, I'm not going to go through all this fluff. I mean, it would just add too much time to our videos if I were to do that every time, especially when we were looking through some of the past Second Ed books, which were much bigger than this one. Um, so I won't be going through all this fluff today, but, I mean, it's at least worth mentioning that we're obviously talking about the third war for Armageddon here. So Gads calls Big Wah against Yark and uh, his Steel Legion. Showing here the Armageddon subsector and how the orcs have moved through, giving you ideas for your games. Awesome. Yeah, the Return of the Beast. That's a co super cool orc pick. I love that piece of art. I've seen it in many books before. And look at this one. This is actually a really cool little thing that they put in the bottom corner here. So there's all the Steel Legion with their gas masks. They almost look Russian or something. And you have this Commissar just hanging out in the middle, all stoic and shit. Cool. Total War. Alright, so we're looking at some some fluff around some of the special characters here. So Orchimedes. This is Gazkal's like mech boy, I believe. Let me read here. Guy whose reputation precedes him, I suppose, and has never actually been given a face. I guess that's why they uh, shadowed him out here. That's pretty cool. He doesn't actually come into the games. He's just in the background. Gazkal, of course. Yark. These are our Two main players, of course, and then Admiral Pearl, who I guess was the uh, guy in charge of the fleets and etc. etc. Yep, Imperial Navy. Uh, authority in which he. A natural authority which few dare to challenge. He's renowned and careful of marshalling up resources at his disposal. His prestigious position in command of the fleet defense of Armageddon. Cool. So yeah, it's telling you here, the Speed Freaks is an add-on for Codex Orcs. The Black Templar is, of course, an add-on for Codex Space Marines. The Salamander, same thing. And then Steel Legion adds on to Codex Imperial Guard. So, there you go. Getting into the Cult of Speed awesomeness. So, as we saw in the last book, um, things like bikes 
and tracks and buggies and all those things were of course uh, fast attack choices and then um, for your HQs you had things like uh, like war boss big mac you know etc etc your troops of course were just shoot a boys um, slug a boys and grots or Gretchen as they referred to them so this just changes things up a bit. I mean, like I say, you could you, you could supplement these into your uh, orc army, I believe, but I think you had to. Yep. So it's including here uh, units from the orc codex that are allowed in the speed freaks army. So you'd be taking your force orb chart from this, adding on the ones with the asterisks. Must be teleported in a war truck. Okay. Yeah. So the ones with the asterisks are saying they have to be mounted. If you have the normal foot slogging units from the Codex, Ard Boys, Scar Boys, etc. Uh, and then, so there you go. As your troops, we don't have any normal boys. Battle wagon. Yeah, we don't have any normal boys. Oh, truck boys. There you go. So those were in the Codex. You could have truck boys. As you, so theoretically, with the Codex by itself, you could field a fast attack army if you chose truck boys as your troops' choices. Uh, in this case, it gives you the option of taking war bikes, war buggies, um, tank busters, and burners also as troop choices. It's really interesting. I guess because they're denying you the use of grots or the big mobs of orcs, they at least want you to be able to take some specialized troops without having to fill out your fast attack and heavy support choices, or elites for that matter, because storm boys are elites here. I think they were actually in the other book too, but ard boys and scar boys might have been troops. I don't even remember. You guys can comment below. I know the video only came out last week, but it was actually a little bit before that that I actually filmed it, so <laughs> I've forgotten by now. But that's okay. So let's look at the actual rules here. So, we're introducing a new HQ unit, which is Knobs War Bikers. That's pretty cool. Those weren't in the book, in the original Orc book. So, a squadron of three of five. They both have twin link big shooters. They're just like normal bikes, but of course they have a knob profile with the upgraded toughness, because a bike always gives you plus one toughness, and pretty much has since this edition. Uh, their special rules, they follow all the rules for war bikes. They apply to war bikes, also apply to knob war bikes. Note that the knobs on war bikes will suffer instant death if they are wounded by a strength 8 or more. Right, that's why they put the 4 and the 5 in brackets, because they are toughness 5 for the most part, but when it comes to insta kill, they're still toughness 4. Which makes perfect sense, because they're still just an orc. Even though the bike does deflect a few shots here and there. <coughs> And then they've added a new fast attack choice, which is really interesting. They're called Outriders. Now, it's basically a war bike squadron. Yep, 3 to 10 Outriders. They have twin length big shooters, just like normal war bikes. But they strip their war bikes of their big shooters and use sluggers and additional close comp weapons instead. These Outriders cost 25 points each instead of, I guess, the normal 35. That's interesting. And of course, the normal plus 22 points to upgrade one to a knob. Cool. All the special rules that apply to war bikes apply to outriders, except they have the scouts ability. That's interesting. So those are your bikers with scouts ability. So they may deploy at the start of the battle, even in scenarios which they could not normally be deployed. For example, if there were a defender in take and hold, the outriders would set up at the start of the game instead of being in reserve. If the scenario is one where you can only deploy a limited number of units, the outriders do you deploy do not count against the limit for the scenario. Also, after both sides have deployed, Outriders may make a free 2d6 move before the first turn takes place, or before any rolls to determine who gets the first turn. All the normal movement rules apply. Okay, so it's basically, yeah, what in 7th edition we knew is the scout ability, which allowed you to basically make a move before your movement phase actually started, so that's, that's pretty cool. Before the game started, I should say. So that's neat. And then... It's funny, because flyers were not a thing in this edition, but you can see here they've actually introduced a fast attack choice called a Fida Bomber's Raid. So, it's basically a preliminary bom bombardment, like you would have with Imperial Guard or anything like that. Let's just read through this. Preliminary Barrage. The effects of a Fida Bomber's attack is determined by resolving a preliminary barrage against the enemy forces, as described in the Scenario Special Rules on page 135, yeah, 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 of the Warhammer 40k rulebook. Again, referring to elsewhere. I'm glad that they've gotten out of that a little bit. You don't need like 10 books to play one army. Anyway. 
The barrage is resolved after both sides have deployed, but before the first movement phase, and can affect the entire opposing army, including reserves. Ooh, that's interesting. If the enemy move on at the beginning of the battle instead of deploying beforehand, resolve the fighter bomber's raid at the end of the enemy's first movement phase. If the scenario you are playing uses preliminary barrage anyway, preliminary barrage anyway, make two rolls to affect each vulnerable unit. Resolve each hit separately, so for example, the unit hit twice, it would suffer 2d6 wounds and need to take two pinning tests. Cool. And also friendly fire. Prior to rolling the preliminary barrage, roll a d6. On a roll of a 1, the fighter bombers are a bit overenthusiastic and strafe everything in the area, including orcs. <laughs> roll for preliminary barrage as before, but make the dice roll for every eligible unit on the table, friend or foe. That's pretty crazy. So that's pretty cool, actually. You could take a fast attack choice that doesn't actually have a physical model represented on the battlefield. Just for 30 points, you get like an extra barrage. That's pretty neat. Actually, that's really cool. Like I say, long before uh, flyers were even a thing in the game. They didn't even bring those in until like 4.5, right before 5th dropped, when they uh, came out with the first Apocalypse set of rules, I believe. So then we're looking at Death Coptis, or Death Copta, as they call it in this. It's interesting, because now it's spelled with a D-E-F, I think. I might be wrong there, but yeah, whatever. One to three, twin link big shooters. So yeah, they're basically just flying bikes, literally, because they are an orc profile with the toughness five. So yeah, they literally are flying bikes. Uh, one of the cop pilots may be upgraded to a mech for free. The mech may be given any equipment allowed from the orc artery, but adaptations needed to carry extra gear on the death copter means that all items in war gear cost the mech five points, an additional five points per item. Ooh. So you get to upgrade him for free, which makes perfect sense, because he is still the same stat line as any other orc. But uh, any war gear he purchases is that much more expensive. That's interesting. And yeah, they literally are flying war bikes. In fact, they have a special rule called flying war bikes. <laughs> oh, man. Death Cop does use the same rules as jet bikes in the Warhammer 40k rulebook. That makes sense. Not Codex Eldar. Hmm. Interesting. I'd have to look back to see what the differences between the rules in the rule book and the rules in Codex Eldar are. It's interesting that they did that because usually, yes, a codex will um, you, you go with whatever rules are the most updated. So if a codex was newer than the rule book, which it usually is, but wasn't always, you'll see as fourth goes, uh, everything's backward compatible. So the third ed books will still be uh, legit. But of course, if they changed it in the fourth ed rule book, then that would apply. And usually that's the case. Obviously, Codex Eldar in this case being newer than the rule book, but not but not being newer than this book. So that's interesting. So they're literally telling you to go back to the rule book as opposed to reading through Codex Eldar. That's 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 interesting. So I, I'll have to look back and see what the difference is and see if that actually made that big of a difference in the game. But they are also subject to the same special rules as ordinary war bikes. Okay, cool. Uh, and yeah, like I say, we looked those over in last week's video, Codex Orcs, so go back and check that out if you are so inclined. Uh, and then so for heavy support, we have the introduction of a gun truck. Now this is basically just a truck with a big gun on the back of it, as far as I know. Uh, because, of course, in this army list, everything has to be mounted. You can't have, like, a big gun sitting at the back. That just doesn't happen. But if it's on a truck, then it's okay. So, one to three gun trucks. Open top, of course. Note that the gun trucks are not fast. So there you go. They're basically trucks where they've taken away the fast ability, which makes sense. They're carrying a large load of artillery. They wouldn't be going nearly as fast as a pickup truck carrying orcs. Uh, gun truck is armed with a big gun chosen from the following list and the points cost indicated. Uh, you may choose either, either a zap gun, a cannon, or a lava. So basically, yeah, just a big gun on the back of the truck. Gun truck may also have either a big shooter or a rocket launcher. So yeah, just like any other truck. And then it has the special rule big gun. If a gun truck rolls a result for its big gun, which normally causes one of the Grot crew to be killed, the weapon does not fire this turn. The gun truck itself and the Grot crew are unharmed. It just doesn't fire. That's pretty cool. Okay. Neat. So you don't have to worry about losing your Grot crew. That's cool. I like it. It doesn't even hurt the truck either. It just prevents it from firing. 
that's such a better um, compromise in my opinion so I guess this is what it meant by forces of Armageddon we've got some color pages before like the rest of the army lists so like I say these were the new models at the time the Armageddon Steel Legion these new pewter models just absolutely beautiful models even still to this day super cool the guys holding the dead orc head <laughs> I just love the gas masks and the half trenches half trench coats neat there you go salamanders still got the old terminators the old plastic terminators but this is the new updated at this point new updated multi-part plastic kit for space marines um, as well as the new updated plastic land raider there's your force commander that was a pewter model that came out at this time it came out at the beginning of third I believe anyway funny they haven't replaced the Terminators yet. Maybe they did that pre-4th ed. But yeah, they've definitely upgraded the, up, uh, upgraded the Land Raider model and the Land Speeders. There you go. So we saw a lot of the second ed ones. This Land Speeder, I believe they actually gave you a Land Speeder um, in the starter set for 3rd edition, now that I think of it, because it was the Dark Eldar vs. Space Marines. And I believe they actually gave you a combat squad of space marines and a land speeder. This, these plastic ones. With Black Templars being the main focus of that starter set. So that's neat. But yeah, you can still see they're still using the old rhinos, the old predators. Huh. Makes me wonder if they even had come out with the new models yet. It's like I say, sometimes they, they take the photos for these books long before these books are produced. So even if the new models had come out by the time this was released these photos were taken long before that and also you gotta remember too the guys in this studio they've been playing all the way through second ed and etc etc so the studio models that they have they're not going to just scrap them for the brand new ones necessarily um, especially if they're their personal armies they're gonna be showing you what they normally play with so cool and yeah this, the extra armor that's kinda neat Hmm. Because I had totally forgotten about that completely. It's pretty cool, though. And here you go. The Speed Freaks. Showing you all the Evil Suns paint schemes you can do. Cool. Some extra pewter grot models thrown around the trucks just to make them look like they have a little more personality. Because, again, this is the uh, Gorka Marka plastic, so you can even see the orcs driving these trucks are m considerably smaller than the, than the updated plastics, although much more dynamic and mu muscular looking than the second dead orcs. So, like I say, it was sort of a gradual upgrade. You had like the second dead orcs, Gorka Morka came out, and they released a bunch of models for Gorka Morka specifically, which again weren't really any bigger than the second dead orcs they were just a little more brawnier looking and then they came out with these plastic orcs when third ed dropped and it was all over from there i mean so there you go they got a new gas call model and these updated uh mega armor guys super cool and again these are uh actually i think the new models are based on these but i don't believe mm. I'm torn. I'm not sure if they actually did update the plastic kit for these or if they're just uh, fine cast now. Like the same pewter models just cast in fine cast. Which is literally what they did when they switched from pewter to resin. They just took all the pewter models and did them fine cast instead. I imagine because you can use the same molds even though it's a different medium. I don't know for a fact but I imagine that's the reason why. Um, Although I do recall hearing of a plastic kit that might just be the Mega Armor characters though, so don't quote me on that. But these are pretty much the updated knobs at this point, or Mega Armor knobs. Because the old Mega Armor knobs, in my opinion, to hold them up to the new ones, or hell, even to hold them up to Terminators in 2nd edition, um, they look more like Power Armor than Terminator Armor. You know what I mean? And really, Mega Armor should be the Orcs version of Terminator Armor. So, anyway... That is what it is. Oh, wow. So then, yeah, they're showing other Space Marine chapters that obviously participated in the Armageddon campaign, but of course didn't need special rules for this book. Cool. And yeah, look at the old model, the old pewter dreadnought. Oh, they've actually put on a circular base. That's interesting. 
Because <laughs> the second they didn't even have bases, and even sometimes you see them on square bases in those pictures. So I'm glad they're starting to update that kind of stuff. But the bike is still on a square base. That's a wicked cool conversion, though, for a White Scars biker. Cool. And yeah, the old school Vindicator. These were all pewter bits that you added onto the plastic rhino kit. It's actually still a pretty badass looking kit. I won't lie there. That's super cool. And then there you go. Imperial Guard on Armageddon. So there wasn't just um, the Steel Legion. They've actually painted those Death Corps of Krieg. Crazy. So yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear the resin models, uh, the F Forge World Death Corps weren't out yet. I always considered mixing these Steel Legions in with my Death, Death Corps models that I have because I always thought, I always loved these models and I always thought it would be wicked cool. That's, that's, I didn't even realize that they actually came up with a paint scheme there that they called the Death Corps. And here you go, they've got Hive Gang Militia because of course Armageddon is a Hive World um, and they've just used Necromunda models. That's super cool. So those are, that's a Vansar model you're seeing there. And then the latest updated plastic catechins. Still think the old pewter ones looked better. Mordians, sweet, but they call them the Pyran Dragoons. And then the old Inquisitorial Stormtroopers, which they're using as Ash Waste Stormtroopers. Cool. Those Stormtrooper models probably came out uh, alongside these. Because later on they were using those as Inquisitorial Stormtroopers. And until later on they came out with the Kazarkin models, which were meant as an upgrade for Cadians, but they pretty much immediately replaced these stormtroopers. And I still think the old second dead beret stormtroopers are awesome, but hey. My point is, we had those beret ones and they came out with these pewter ones and they probably only lasted like four years before they came out with a whole, a whole bunch of new pewter ones which looked so much cooler, so people just used those instead. And then basically, you know, the pewter ones you just saw went obsolete pretty much right away, so it's crazy we've been using the same buggy for 25 years, but stormtroopers can't last more than four years. Anyway. And I always love shots of miniatures in action, the Steel Legion squaring off against the Cult of Speed. Super cool. Catachans moving through the jungles, blowing up some orc buildings. Neat. There you go, rolling up through the hive, the Steel Legion. That's cool how they put that pipe there like that. Neat. That gives me all kinds of ideas for terrain. Because you know, guys, all this, like other than these plastic bul these, these bulkheads here, which are clearly the plastic bulkheads from both the Gorkamorka and Necromunda games, um, the rest of this is probably plastic card and cardstock, to be totally honest with you. A little bit of styrofoam here and there, and then yeah, some plastic pipes. Wow, super easy to do. Just gives me so many ideas for future projects. Anyway, let's get into the Black Templars. So they got some special rules here right off the bat, which I assume apply only to the Black Templars. Right, Righteous Seal, that makes perfect sense. Hurled themselves at the enemy in greater determination, fever, fervent anger, sorry. If they have to fall back, they will not fall back. Instead, the unit heads towards the nearest enemy. The distance of their special move is the same as the fallback move. So most units advance 2d6. And this is halved if they go through difficult terrain. Okay, 3d6 if they're jump packs, yeah, etc. If this movement takes the unit into contact with an enemy unit, the Black Templars count as making a sweeping advance. Okay, that's definitely a benefit. With all the benefits and disadvantages that that entails. They count as assaulting enemy units, yet to shoot, yet to shoot can still target them and unengaged enemy models may assault them. You can't assault falling back units anyway. Weird. Designer's note. Morale checks for shooting candles she's taken at the end of the shooting phase, but this rule has been included to cover any any morale checks that may occur in the shooting phase, like the Salamander's new psychic power. Okay, we'll have to see what the Salamander's new psychic power is when we get there. 
In close combat, Black Templars automatically pass morale checks they have to make. Black Templars may never use the optional voluntary fallback rules, right? Because Space Marines had the and they shall know no fear, which means if they broke, they fell back, but then they automatically rallied. Um, I guess in this case, Black Templars don't fall, don't tactically fall back. They get angry and they charge forward, which is really cool. Uh, purity seals. I thought the Space Marines had purity seals. No extra points cost. They also be given purity seals at plus two points per model. Neophytes. Oh, I see. Because they were war gear for uh, sergeants and characters and stuff in the Space Marine book, and it's saying you can give them to every Black Templar Marine for plus two points, but the characters get them for free. Neat. Neophytes may not be given purity seals. Okay, that makes sense. So those neophytes are your scouts, for those of you who don't know. Uh, if the model of purity seals is still alive, then unit an entire unit gains its benefits. Due to the righteous seal rules given above, purity seals allow the squad to roll an extra dice and discard one dice if you of your choice for their movement towards the enemy rather than for fallback moves, as normally is the case. Okay, cool. Right, so before it would have to be on your sergeant, and then it would allow you that re-roll when falling back, whereas this one can be on every guy, so it doesn't matter who's still alive, and then it allows you that re-roll on moving forward, so that's pretty cool. Black Temper Squads often has models with different armor saves. Yeah, of course, because they mix Space Marines and Scouts in the same units, right? Uh, must make armor saves to the majority of the type of models in the unit. So if there are more initiates than neophytes, then a 3 plus armor save. But if there's neophytes on number of the initiates, it's a 4 plus armor save. Uh, if there's an equal number, then use the initiates 3 plus save. That makes sense. As it's been with many other cases in the history of this game. So they have special vows they can take. So the Black Templars must swear one of the following vows before battle. They can accept any challenge, no matter what the odds. So a unit in the Black Tempest Army must assault the enemy if they are in range. Uh, they must make an advance move if they win at combat, and they would normally be allowed to do so. In close combat, the Black Templars always hit on 3+, plus regardless of their opponent's weapon skill. Right, so again, in this edition, guys, um, what you had to hit actually mattered uh, based on your opponent's weapon skill, not like it is an 8th where you just automatically get a 3 plus regardless of who you're fighting. Which I wish they never changed, but you know, you can't have it all I guess. I definitely like 8th a lot, but in this edition we're still using the old chart like we did even in 2nd. And like I said in past videos, it lasted us all the way through 7th and is still alive in Horus Heresy, at least until they redo that rule set, so we'll see what happens there. But for now, that's a pretty cool advantage to always hit on 3 plus. You know, because a lot of the Elder Aspect Warriors and stuff, you're looking at, like, weapon skill 5 and stuff like that. So, you know, you're hitting them with 3s now instead of 4s, which is great. Uh, if only Neophytes remain in the unit, they are not bound by this vow, and Dreadnoughts in the army are bound by this vow. Cool. Right, because it does say that this vow has no effect on vehicles, but... Obviously, Dreadnoughts do have a weapon skill. Vehicles don't normally have a weapon skill. So, next one is Uphold the Honor of the Emperor. Uh, Black Templars refuse to skulk behind cover like cowards. They may not count cover for saving throws or when assaulted. However, such is their faith in themselves that they shrug off even the most severe wounds. So gain a 6-up invulnerable save. Neophytes may count cover as normal, but do not gain the invulnerable save. Okay. Still having a 6-up invulnerable save on all your space marines, that's pretty cool. Especially because these vows don't cost points, right? Suffer not the unclean to live. When rolling wounds in close combat, Black Templars add plus 1 to their dice roll. Ooh, plus 1 to wound for free? That's gross. Roll of a 1 always fails, of course. Black Templars need to summon their holy strength, so strike at negative 1 to their initiative. Oh, okay, that's a drawback. Neophytes strike and wound normally. Yeah, so it's funny how none of these actually affect the scouts. I guess because they're not real initiates yet. Pure in mind, body, and soul. Of all deviants, Black Templars abhor witches and warlocks the most. The 
The faintest sign of heretical psychic powers drives them into violent fervor. This vow affects all Black Templar units, including vehicles. If there is an enemy psyker on the table at the start of the Black Templar's first move phase, the Black Templars must make an additional move towards the enemy before their normal movement. Interesting. You get a free move at the beginning of the game, but it has to be towards the enemy psychers. Huh. Distance moves 2d6 inches. Roll for each unit. And each unit must move the full distance. Oh. That limits you a bit, eh? Man, this is really problematic. Your army could just totally work against you. You'd have to use these things very carefully. Anyway, ending the move, initial surge forward. Units make normal move without restriction. All units count as moving that turn when resolving their shooting. Vehicles count as moving under 6 inches unless they move over 6 inches during their normal movement. Right, okay. Black Templar only gain this extra move for the first turn. Still, if you really wanted to get up there, that would be a nice push at the beginning of the game. Cool, so again, they've given you a list of what units can be included in this army list. So they've included units from Codex Space Marines in this list, as well as the additional units they've given you here. So of course, for, uh, I'm gonna skip ahead right now to our troops because we were just talking about that before. So unlike a normal tactical squad, you have between five and 10 Marines, and then you have five initiates like attached to the squad. So those are like five scouts attached to your unit of Space Marines. Which is still, I think, the case today that Black Templars have their Crusader squads or whatever they call them. I think they call them Crusader squads. So it's interesting that this is the first time this was done. And then that's pretty much followed us through all the way through. So it's funny here because it actually says Troops Black Templar squad. So you can't even choose your normal scout squads or tactical squads in, if you're taking a Black Templar's army. You have to choose the Templar squads. Uh, but anyway, the new HQ choices they've introduced us to is uh, Black Templar's Marshal, which is interesting. I, I was under the impression that's just a captain. And yes, it has two degrees, so yeah, it would probably be a captain and force commander kind of idea. Command squad, yep. And so, yep, Marshal, Chaplain, Command squad, okay, so yep. They are not allowing you to use the normal captains or any of them, or obviously not librarians. But chaplains are still cool, and command squads, of course, get attached to the character, because it says here, command squad. Then the Emperor's Champion, that was a new addition. Uh, now they have chapter champions, are they called, or company champions in every Space Marine Legion, but this was the first time we saw the champion like that. Just that one model that, you know, kicked butt. Because there's only supposed to be one Emperor's Champion, but there's so many Black Templar fleets that some of them don't even know that the other ones exist. So even though the Codex Astartes tells them that they can only have 1,000 brothers in a chapter, it's rumored that the Black Templars actually have more than that because there's so many splintered fleets. They don't have a home world like the other Space Marine chapters. Uh, and so it is totally possible that at any given point in time there is more than 1,000. And so by that logic, it would only be possible that there is more than one Emperor's Champion somewhere in the galaxy. Or could be at any given time, is the theory. Um, if they were unaware of the other, that is. But, of course, they're putting one here. Which is interesting, because it doesn't say zero to one. So it's my interpretation that that would mean you have to have an Emperor's Champion as an HQ choice. So that's cool. Yep, must be taken in a Black Templar's army, even if both players have not agreed to use special characters. Cool. But stat wise, it looks like he's not that much better. He's basically a sergeant with a higher initiative because he doesn't have a ballistic skill of five like the, like the captains and stuff do. But he is two wounds and he does have an initiative of five to attack. So, yeah, but two attacks and leadership nine is normal for your sergeants or veteran sergeants, I should say. Uh, so, let's check out his war gear. Because he's got Artificer Armor, Terminator Honors, Purity Seals, Iron Halo, Mastercrafted Bolt Pistol, the Black Sword. And he cannot buy extra equipment, of course, because he's basically a special character without actually being a named character. Because he's it's always a different guy who becomes the Emperor's Champion. It's never the same guy. Although I guess, fluff-wise, that's the case with Phoenix Lords, too. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, let's not wander down that rabbit's hole. So, what does the Black Sword do? It is a 
can be used with two hands or a single-handed weapon is treated as a power weapon with plus one strength. May be used in addition to the champion's bolt pistol. If used as a double head weapon, it counts as being a power fist. That's cool. Okay. Power weapon that is plus one strength or doubles your strength. Ignoring saves, because again, power weapons, power fists, all that stuff just ignored saves in this edition. They actually didn't have an AP value on close combat weapons yet. Uh, that was only on shooting weapons in this edition. It wasn't until either 5th or 6th, it might have even been 6th, where they introduced, uh, maybe it was 5th, where they introduced the standard sort of characteristics for weapons, whether they were shooting weapons or combat weapons, it didn't matter. Um, that's when they introduced AP for combat weapons. Back here it was either you got a save, you didn't get a save, or it like modified your save in the case of choppas, or uh, you'll see later with Corn Berserker chain axes that they, you know, reduced anything better than a 4 plus to a 4 plus, but other than that, there was really no modifiers to your armor. You either got a save or you didn't. Anyway, moving on. So Black Templar Salt Squads, we can see here, are different than normal Salt Squads. For what reason? Five, ten models. They have jump packs, crack grenades, melt bombs. Two models, maybe you get a plasma pistol, may exchange a quick combo weapon for a power weapon or a power fist. Any model may exchange his bolt pistol for a storm shield. Yikes. That's super cool. Don't think normal assault marines can do that, but everything else sounds pretty standard. And black type of models can be deep strike. Yeah, of course. If you have a jump pack, you can deep strike. Uh, bike squadrons. There we go. So we've got a mixture of normal bikers and scout bikers, which is pretty cool. Three and five initiates. You may also include up to three neophytes. All models mounted on Space Marine bikes. Now, I'm not even sure if they had scout biker units back then. Hmm. Hmm. That's something I'm gonna have to look back on. I mean, feel free to comment below if they did or didn't have actual scout biker models, or if they expected you to convert them. I don't even remember. We currently have plastic scout bikes, but. Back in this day, I don't think there was plastics, at least. If there was, there would have been like a pewter upgrade to the normal Space Marine bike. Anyway, let's not get off on that, because I don't even know what the hell I'm talking about, really. So, <laughs> what makes them rules-wise different from normal Space Marine bike units, other than the fact that you can take scouts in the unit? Uh, twilling bolters, everybody has a bolt pistol. They exchange their bolt pistol up to two, may exchange their bolt pistol for the following. So, special weapons, common. Flamer, Melted Gun, Plasma Gun, Power Weapon, Frag Grenades, Crack Grenades, that's it. So yeah, I guess the only thing that makes them different is the fact that they mix initiates into those squads too. So, hmm. And the Land Raider Crusader. So this, I guess, was the introduction of the Land Raider Crusader. I thought they didn't introduce that model until 4th, but I guess I was wrong. Because up until this point, we only had what people refer to as the God Hammer pattern. I don't know where that name came from, but the standard Land Raider, the Last Cannon and Heavy Bolter Land Raider. Uh, this one had the Hurricane Bolters instead of the Last Cannon Sponsons. It allowed an Assault Cannon instead of the Heavy Bolter, and then a Pintel Multi Melta, I believe. Let me see here. Dozer Blade, Hunter Killer, Pintel Storm Bolter. Yeah, so Unlike the, the other one, which just had the twin heavy bolter and then the two twin las cannons, this one has hur two hurricane pattern bolters, a twin linked assault cannon, and a multi melta. So it's already heavier, but anti armor and anti infantry, which is pretty cool. And the frag assault launchers, that was a new one too. Making, uh, giving your guys a little cover when they assault out of the front of it. Um,. You can have dozer blades, hunter killer missile, pinto storm bolt, their search light, smoke launchers, so that's all standard. Extra space created by, oh that's the thing, they could carry more, so it can have up to 15 marines or 8 terminators. That's interesting, instead of the normal 10 marines and 5 terminators, so that's pretty cool. I believe it's transport capacity changed in later editions, but that's unheard of, this 15 marines in a tank, that's unheard of before this. Um, Note, you can't put a 10-man squad and a 5-man squad inside at the same time. Right. You can only attach independent characters. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It wasn't until now in 8th where you could actually have more than one unit in a transport at a time. Back then, 
actually no edition before this could you have more than one unit before eighth I should say no edition before eighth could you have more than one unit in a transport that's something they definitely added for eighth edition uh, yeah then they're just making the point here I guess oh it does say other Space Marine chapters may take the Crusader pattern land raider but they're of greater rarity outside the Black Templars which means that chapters are limited to having only one cool I guess that's because they came out with they had to come up with a new model for this. Like they had to introduce a new sprue to the Land Raider kit, so I guess they actually wanted to sell it, and so they were like, well, you know, other chapters can take it too, why not? So I just want to read the rules for the hurricane bolters. Yep, count as three twin-link bolt guns. That's exactly what you expect them to be. And they can fire regardless of how fast it's moved, that's pretty cool. The frag assault launchers. Pearl shrapnel with the enemy and the troops inside charge and the assault ramp. Assault on the same turn it disembarked from the Crusader count as having frag grenades. Okay. I guess you couldn't throw grenades normally. Oh, Terminators don't have grenades. That's where it has the advantage. Right. Because if you just had Terminators assault out of a normal land raider, they couldn't throw grenades because they don't have grenades. Whereas this allows them to. So that's cool. That's cool. We're seeing how this works now, right guys? All right, so let's check out the Salamander special rules. What makes them different from normal Space Marines? People of Nocturne are dogged and stubborn. So this rule is called Never Give Up. To represent this, at the end of the game, the Salamander's player can decide to continue fighting for one more turn. Wow. Another whole game turn is played as normal, i.e. each player gets one more turn. The result of the battle is decided after that turn is finished. Salamander's player can always opt to fight for one more turn whether the game is a fixed length or finishes randomly. Cool, that's neat. It's fluffy. Uh, they are self-reliant, so they lead a mainly solitary life when not fighting. Alongside their battle brothers, they are raised and trained to be self-sufficient and independent. Salamander's models never have the all-on-your-own morale checks. Never take all-on-your-own morale checks. Uh, now, I don't know off the top of my head what that is, but I'm going to assume that when you're down to one model, you're like constantly testing to see if that one guy's running away. There may be negatives implied. I don't know. I guess salamanders just never have to worry about that. So that's pretty cool. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember what that rule does, but uh, it's obviously an advantage or else they wouldn't have put it here. So definitely comment below and let me know what that rule was if I haven't already looked it up by the time you comment and by the time this is released. Uh, so they are sturdy, which means on high gravity of Nocturne means that the inhabitants have a naturally large, well-muscled physique and they adapt to ordeals of becoming space means very well. However, they are not as swift as their counterparts of other chapters, so salamanders, with the exception of dreadnoughts, have their initiative reduced by negative one. Huh? Space Marines at initiative 3? That's crazy talk. Entries in the following army list have already been modified, but taking this into account, the Salamanders must also deduct one inch from advance or fallback moves. Huh. So 2d6 minus 1. Jeez, that kind of sucks. Anyway, we've got some new war gear. The Salamanders Mantle. Character wears a cloak or a cape made from one of the toughest materials in the galaxy, the thick hide of nocturne salamander lizards, which live in the lava flows of the planet's volcanoes. This character is immune to suffering instant death caused by a hit of the attack, which has a strength value double to his toughness, right? That would be what causes instant death. The character loses a single wound instead. Note that instant death can be suffered in any other way. Example, can be suffered in any other way. Oh, so it's only things that are double strength. Right. So I think it's a special rule that institutes instant death. It still works the way it does. It's just the double strength thing doesn't... Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Only one model in the army may have this at 35 points, though. Special characters, Chaplain Xavier, Codex Space Marines, wears a Salamander's Mantle, increasing his cost to 200 points. Right, so they included a Salamander special character in Codex Space Marines, and now they're just saying you have to add this to him if you have him in your army. Okay. Like a little bolt-on war gear piece. Bolt-on rules-wise, I mean, not physically bolted to its body. 
Uh, artificer armor and weapons. Deep knowledge of many technological marvels. Tech Marines are greatest artificers outside of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Following changes are made to Space Marine Armory in the Salamander's Force. Mastercrafted weapons cost 10 points rather than 15. Artificer armor may be purchased for non-independent characters, such as apothecaries and veteran sergeants. Ooh, that's handy. For 15 points. Independent characters play 20. Any character may be given a Signum, not just Terminators. Cool. Okay. And then for vehicle upgrades, they've given us a Reinforced Ceramite. I'm just going to skim through here to try and speed this up. Uh, right, so you don't get the extra dice for melted weapons for being at half range. Also, you're reducing the armor pen for melted bombs, which is interesting. So it's only 8 plus 1d6 instead of 2d6. May be given to any Salamander's vehicle and Dreadnought except land speeders. That makes sense. They're not going to give them extra armor. They're going to move fast. Uh, 25 points for a land raider to have ceramite and 10 points for all other vehicles. Cool. So once again, you're only allowed these. And there's a whole bunch of zero ones here. That's crazy. Yeah, zero one, zero one. Huh. So every fast attack choice are all zero one options. Crazy. And they can't have any of the normal ones from the normal codex, so you're like literally you're only ever allowed to take one of each. What if you were playing a large game? I guess back then they didn't even consider that. Uh, so for the librarian, like I, they said before, they've just added the extra psychic power. They didn't actually change the librarian, right? It's just the normal one from the Space Marine Codex. Assuming again minus one initiative. Which kind of sucks. I didn't even remember that at all, that Salamanders were all initiative 3. That blows horse nuts. Anyway, let's read this new Psychic Power, since it's a brand new Psychic Power at this point, and it relates to the Black Templar rules before. Fury of the Salamander. The Librarian draws on the legendary spirit of the Salamander to create a monstrous spectral incarnation of the beast. The monster charges forward, trailing fiery sparks and burning all on its path. The Librarian uses this power in the shooting phase instead of firing a weapon, nominate a direction for the Librarian that the Salamander will move in, and draw a line 3d6 long in that direction. You cannot choose a line that might pass through a unit in close combat, of course, because you can't shoot at your friends, right? Any model, friend or foe, which the line crosses over takes a strength 5 hit. Normal saving throws are allowed. A unit suffering any casualties from this attack must take an immediate morale check or fall back. If the unit passes the check, but loses 25% or more, in that shooting phase it must still take another morale check for casualties at the end of the phase as normal. Huh. So for elites, they've given us Salamander Terminators. So what makes Salamander Terminators different from the normal? Well, obviously they've introduced the Initiative 3. Uh, Sergeant and 4 to 9 Terminators. It's standard 2 up save, plus 1 attacks, but not included in their profile. Yeah, so they're just veterans. Normal Terminators always have two attacks anyway. Now, all models have a Storm Boulder and Power Fist, or Thunder Hammer and Storm Shield. Okay. Sergeant may replace his Power Fist with Power Weapon. Two models may exchange their Storm Boulder for a Heavy... Two models may exchange their Storm Boulder for a Heavy Flamer. Yikes. Right, so they don't even have the Assault Cannon option. And I don't think other Terminator units in the normal book could have two Heavy Weapons. So that's a cool advantage. And yeah, of course, they have Deep Strike. All Terminators have Deep Strike. Salamander's Tactical Squad. So actually, I'm just going to go back for a second and look at this. So like, all they're allowing you to take from the normal book anyway is Scout Squads, which I guess you're just going to take the initiative off those. Other than that... Chaplain, Librarian, Command Squad, Terminator Squad. Huh. So yeah, I guess the chaplain, the command squad, and the scout squad. Otherwise, everything else is specific to these guys, because they have like obviously all the vehicles don't even have an initiative characteristic in the first place. So there you go. Don't have to worry about that. So it's only like the three sheets. It's weird. Anyway, back to the point. 
other than the initiative, let's see what makes Salamander's tactical squads different from normal tactical squads. Models armed with a bolter, plays a bolter with a bolt pistol with combo weapon, yeah, it's normal. You have a flamer, heavy bolter, missile launcher, multi melta. In addition, one space marine in the squad makes changes bolter with one of the following flamer, melted gun, plasma guns, so one special, one heavy, okay, that's normal. Frag and crack grenades, yep, yeah, okay. Uh, upgrade to a veteran sergeant. And they can have a rhino or a razorback. So, yeah, other than the initiative, I don't see anything that makes them different from normal space marines. Ah. They put flamer in with the heavy weapons. So you could have two flamers. Or your normal heavy weapon special weapon. That's if that's the only difference other than the initiative. That's silly that they completely rewrote it, but I, I'd imagine that's the reason you can have two flamers like a Chaos Space Marine squad. Interesting. Uh, Salamander's assault squads. Yep, close combat frag grenades, jump packs, crack grenades, melted bombs. Exchange their close combat bolt pistol and close combat weapon for a flamer. Okay, so that makes them different than normal assault squads, I guess. Yeah, that's the only thing. So, again, they can have flamers, which normal assault squads can't, and they have initiative three. Other than that, they're exactly the same. And bike squads. Oh, okay, so bike squads incorporate an attack bike into the unit, as opposed to attack bikes being a separate choice. That's kind of neat. And this is before Ravenwing, right? So I guess that was the first time this, this really happened, where they incorporated all of them into one unit. But no scout bikes, so that's worth mentioning. Yeah, Flamer, Melt Gun, Plasma Gun. Yep, yeah, other than that, they're the same. And yeah, you just, Squadron may include one attack bike armor with a Melty Melta. That's it. Okay, so. Steel Legion. Interesting. So for Imperial Guard companies, you got your infantry companies are taken from the Imperial Guard book. You may use Death World veteran units from Codex Catechins. Interesting. For your mechanized infantry, you are going to use Codex Armageddon. So that's this one, I guess. For your jungle fighters, you can use Codex Catechins, Death World veteran list, Armageddon Sentinels. They can be armed with a heavy flamer, multi laser, or las cannon. Well, those are the armored sentinels, right? Uh, I'm gonna have to look back in the Imperial Guard book, and we're gonna have to see. But I think they could have las cannon. Oh, actually, maybe they couldn't. It was either auto cannons or uh, multi lasers. Actually, I think originally, probably. Again, I could be wrong. Comment below. Correct me if I'm wrong. I love getting corrected. I have no ego. Uh, Steel Legion mechanized infantry. Uh, armor 40,000, very straightforward, simply picked from the standard Imperial Guard list in Codex Imperial Guard. Death World veterans use Codex Catechins, may not be used in a Steel Legion mechanized company. Okay. All units in a Steel Legion mechanized company, infantry company, must be vehicle units or have a Camara transport. Units that don't normally have the option may take a Camara transport, such as heavy weapons teams. That's cool. Uh, it must do for 70 points plus the cost of upgrades. Rough Riders may not be given a Chimera, obviously, but may still be included in the army as it is assumed that they are fast enough to keep up with the rest of the units, right? So you can still have Rough Riders, that's cool. Uh, Chimera Special Rules. Only special rules apply to chimeras used in mechanized infantry companies. They may also be used in chimeras in a sp standard Imperial Guard army, as long as both players are aware of the rules before the game starts. In all cases, these rules take precedence over the rules of the Warhammer 40,000 rulebook. In particular, they replace the rules for troops firing from vehicles on page 82. Right, because it has the LAS guns. So I guess in Codex Imperial Guard, they didn't allow for the six LAS guns to fire. In this, they have. 
Oh, maybe they did, and it was half the number of models on board. This says six models transporting the camera might fire from the vehicle rather than half of the models on board. Right, so if it's, yeah, if you're less than 12 models, you can still fire all six instead of, let's say, you had 10 models and they're only firing five before, even though there's six guns. Okay, that's pretty cool. And there, of course, their shots are limited to firing last guns. So that makes perfect sense. But there is a top hatch, which allows models outside to shoot out. This allows weapons other than last guns to be fired. We shoot from the hatch. Interesting, any models using chimeras last guns. However, if they do, then the chimera counts as being an open topped. Okay. So if they open the doors, then it's open topped. Um. Vehicles rest of turns, so it's going to turns. Models may shoot any type of weapon, not just last guns, that's including heavy weapons that require two crew, even mortars. Models shooting from the hatch must engage the same unit as the models firing the last guns, obviously. Remember that heavy weapons may not be fired from the hatch in the same turn that a chimera moved, obviously. They always have to say these things, I guess, even though some of these things are pretty uh, like obvious to a lot of people who are playing in this edition, but they always have to cover their ass, right? They still do that to this day. It has an access ramp, so units being transported and chimeras enter and exit the vehicle via the access ramp on the back of the hull. Because of this, models may only embark if they're within two inches of the ramp rather than within two inches of the vehicle. Cool. So it has an extra few inches to the back, allowing you to get in quicker, I guess. That's pretty cool. By the same token, models that disembark must be placed two inches from the access ramp. Okay. That's extra special rules. I, if I remember correctly, in this edition, Chimeras were the best transports in the game, because this, this too, it, they're amphibious, which means they can move over water, treat all water features as ridges, streams, lakes, or seas as clear terrain. That's cool. Yeah, I remember even back in this time that they were way better than your normal, like, rhino, because first of all, they have a heavy weapon on them, second of all, they can fire all six LAS guns out. Which is awesome. And then the amphibious thing just makes it super cool if you even play with water terrain. Not a lot of people did, but it is what it is, right? And then they're allowing you a detachment for planetary defense force. So this is a whole different thing altogether. In which case they were going they would use if you play an Armageddon planetary defense force, you're gonna use Augrens and Ratlings, Rough Riders and Death World Sentinels, Lehman Russ Vanquishers and Lehman Russ Exterminator Exterminators as well as these Hive Gang Militia. So in addition to Sentinels, Basilisks, and Griffins must be given the Armored Crew Compartments. Right, that makes sense, because they're Steel Legion, right? They have to have everything enclosed, because obviously out in the ash wastes, humans can't breathe very well. So, there you go. Uh, as the crew and gun mechanisms need to be protected from the corrosive effects of the ash wastes. There you go, just like I said. Hive Gang Militia units may be included in the Armageddon Planetary Defense Force and only in an Armageddon, Armageddon Planetary Defense Force. Okay. So even though the Chimera rules apply and you can use your Land Raider, Crusader, and other lists, it's telling you these Hive Gang Militia can only be used in this list. And stat-wise, they're Imperial Guard, they just have a lower leadership of 5, but they have a Gang Leader, which is Weapon Skill 4, that's way better than... and 2 wounds! Yikes! with initiative four. Wow, it's way better than a, the normal sergeant that leads an Imperial Guard unit. Crazy. Like that's literally what your knob upgrade thing is. Extra weapon skill, extra wound, extra initiative, extra attack. Three more leadership, Jesus. Wow, that makes those leaders very important. Five to 20 gangers and one gang leader. Use a variety of black market and homemade <laughs> Dubi weapons of a dubious quality. These count as either a LAS pistol or auto pistol in close combat weapon, or a shotgun, LAS gun, or an auto gun. They can mix the weapons with each Hive Gang or Militia unit. Neat. Up uh, to one model may have a Flamer, Melted Gun, Heavy Stubber, Heavy... as Heavy Bolter with a strength of four, and... Oh, interesting. So there was no rules for Heavy Stubbers yet. So it's basically they're saying it's a Heavy Bolter with a strength four and AP six. Huh. Maybe this is the first time they introduced Heavy Stubbers to 3rd edition. Uh, grenade Launcher. In addition, one model may have the following Heavy Bolter Missile Launcher, Last Cannon, Plasma Gun. Heavy Plasma Gun. So I guess it's a Plasma Cannon, right? That's what they called it in 2nd. It is a Heavy Plasma Gun. I guess they haven't changed that yet. 
So basically they're just telling you here to use your Necromunda models, more or less, in 40k. And if they have a variety of different weapons, it's fine. Uh, your character can choose equipment from the Imperial Guard Armory. That's normally allowed for officers, it makes perfect sense. No Chimera, however. High Fame Militia may never be equipped with a Chimera and cannot be included in a mechanized infantry company. Note, Hive Gangers can be represented by Necromunda models. <laughs> yeah, literally, that's what they're doing. Oh, it's cool here, they put a couple of the character blurbs here for you. Sir Herman von Straub, that's the, I believe, the Lord of Armageddon, the Planetary Lord. And then who's General Kurov? That's interesting. Lieutenant for the first and second battles of Tartarus Hive. Reaching the rank of Colonel by the end of the campaign. Shortly afterwards, Kurov took part in the Bacchus Crusade, where he was appointed Lord Commander. Two Lord Commander box staff, sorry, my bad. Over other campaigns, he has proved to be one of the most reliable and able Imperial commanders of recent times. He is currently in direct command of the Imperial Guard forces on Armageddon. Cool. And then we got a little outro by Jervis Johnson, sort of teaching you or telling you about narrative ideas, how to arrange the campaign, and that kind of thing. And then, of course, as always, at the end, they just give you some cool, fluffy stuff maps of the continents showing where Armageddon is and its solar system, as well as all the other planets that were fought over. And there you go. That's an Imperial Guard force laid out. Neat. Yep, yeah, Legion of Astartes, Imperial Guard, Depths of Sororitas. Wow, so these are all the armies that fought. Crazy. Is that what this is? Yeah, the Angels of Fire, seven companies. Angels of Redemption, four companies. Angels of Vigilance, six companies. Angels Porphyr, eight companies. Wow. Black Dragons, Black Templars, Blood Angels, Celebrants, Celestial Lions. Actually, well, that's a lot of Space Marine chapters, man. Holy crap. Yeah, a whole lot of Imperial Guard regiments. They even list Adeptus Me Mechanicus. That's interesting. Guitari, 14 regiments. Because there really is no Adept I mean, there were some Adeptus Mechanicus rules in that uh, rule book, but they were just like tech priests and stuff. I don't think there was anything more than that. Here they've got straight up Titan Legions listed. Again, I guess it's just fluff, but yeah, and Adeptus Arbites too. That's cool. Punitive Battalions. Neat. So anyway, that is the first supplement book that I believe I've shown you guys for 3rd edition, Codex Armageddon. So I hope you all enjoyed that look at Codex Armageddon. I had a wicked fun time looking at it. Now, I thought I had all of the 3rd edition books, but it actually turns out I guess I don't. So I'm going to have to get my hands on the Imperial Guard and the Catachan book and all that kind of stuff, as well as a few of the others. But uh, I've shown you more or less what I have. Not entirely, though, because, of course, we're going to be going into the uh, 3.5 stuff pretty much next. Uh, actually, next week, what we're actually going to be doing is looking at the Eye of Terror Codex. So that's another supplement book, much like the one we just saw, um, but a little bit different, of course. So this is going to give you rules for uh, Lost in the Damned. So that's like Codex Imperial, uh, Chaos Imperial Guardsmen and stuff like that, what now is known as sort of like Renegades and Heretics kind of situation. Um, as well as some other cool stuff. So anyway, we'll check that out next week. So I hope you guys have been enjoying this series so far. I've been having a great time looking back on over all this old stuff. Like I say, it gives me those warm feelings of nostalgia inside, which I just love. So if you guys love this, please hit the like button. Hit that subscribe button so you know when these videos come out. But we also, we don't just do this stuff, guys. We also do a whole bunch of other stuff. We do terrain tutorials, hobby tutorials. We have a podcast. We do battle reports. Um, we do multiple game systems, not just Worm or 40,000, uh, and so sus subscribing is huge for you. We cover as many aspects of the wargaming hobby as we can, and uh, let, let's just say it's a great time being a subscriber of Encounter Wargaming. But if you want to have an even better time, then become a patron. Please check out our Patreon link in the description below. I won't go into too much detail now, but there's a whole bunch of extra perks on there for you, so just click on the link below and check it out. Um, and any little bit gets you a whole bunch more content, it gets you this content early and it helps us out a little bit, as well as, like I say, a whole bunch of other perks. Uh, 
That being said, if you just want to throw us a couple bucks or whatever and get yourself a sweet t-shirt, we also have a Spreadshirt page so you can get yourself a t-shirt, a hat, whatever you need with our logo on it and it just helps us out a little bit and gets you some cool swag so other than that just hit subscribe hit like and we'll see you at our next encounter hey everybody i'm adam and i'm jay we are encounter wargaming and we wanted to celebrate hitting our 1500 subscribers with giving some stuff away what are we giving away adam fort bang all right, we're calling this the 2,500 subscriber Forge Bane giveaway because that's the target we need to hit to give this puppy away. That's right. So the first thing you need to do is share this video, the video you are watching right now. And then click subscribe on YouTube. If you haven't already. That's it for one entry. And the more you share it, hopefully, the more people we can get to hit subscribe and hit that 2,500. Woohoo! But there are other ways to win as well. Tell them about it. Well, you can follow us on Twitch. That will also get you an entry. So you subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Twitch. On top of that, support us on Patreon for five big buckaroo entries. Crazy. So also all the people that already support us on Patreon, don't worry, you're also five entries. But also, you can hit subscribe on Twitch. Subscribing on Twitch will get you another five entries into the contest. So good, and all of this to say thank you guys for all the support. We appreciate it very much. We've come a long way, and it's because of you. It's true. It's been a wild ride, and thanks for all the support, all the help, and we want to give, a, give you some cool stuff as a thank you. Awesome. So, hey, remember to share this video, and uh, guys, I think that's it. So, we'll see you at our next encounter. <laughs>